Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today uh, on Raising the Bar with myself, John Cooper. And as you know, I've been speaking to a lot of survivors, survivors that have gone through MK Ultra programming, satanic ritual abuse, uh, many things in fact that have been quite torturous, traumatic. And uh, I've been talking to these survivors and helping them to make sense of their past and, you know, put the jigsaw pieces back together again. And um, this lady reached out to me on TikTok. Uh, she noticed some of the videos I was putting out. Her name's Rebecca. How are you doing, Rebecca? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, good is because it's, uh, you know, this is quite big for you, isn't it? I, 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 you know, I felt that from you. It's quite significant and it's, you know, slightly nerve wracking, isn't it? It is, um, mostly because I try to hide myself from the people that did what they did to me. I feel like I've been trying to run and hide from them, like, forever um but i realized that speaking out is important and not too long ago my story made most people shut down they're like oh that's like a movie that can't be real as soon as i mentioned certain high profile names but now we're living in a an age where i can tell my story and people believe it because we've seen so much so many people coming forward and that's important um yeah, it's important yeah, no. because for me specifically, I spent a lot of my life uh, coming forward and trying to tell people about what was happening. And it seemed like no matter what I, I did, I couldn't get any help from anyone. Um, mm. And I, I don't want any other child to ever feel that way. So I've always kind of said that uh, if what I went through can help even just one person, then it's all worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you on behalf of everyone watching as well. Thank you for having the courage and bravery to come forward, because that, as you said, it has that ripple effect, that domino effect where it gives permission to other people to to then say, oh, OK, it's safety in numbers. If one's coming out, another can come out. And then, you know, it, it creates that tipping point. And, you know, it, re it requires the first brave people to, to do that. So, you know, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and um, yeah, you're right about, you know, Jimmy Savile in England came out, the Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein Island. Uh, Prince Andrew, you know, a lot of high profile names, it kind of legitimized everything and it made it more credible, the story. And so people that would have in the past been a little bit, you know, ostracized, shut down. Now their voice is being heard a lot more. So, you know, you know, I love it, really. It's great. It's good news, isn't it, really? It is. And to see so many people from different walks of life coming together on this issue mm. um, and situations where different groups might have been polarized and um you know cut each other out people are coming together all across the board and i think that's really great um mm. so and it's a uniting factor because people really do care about the children and the children are the future mm. and uh, i don't mm. think most people can handle the realization of how controlled everything really is mm. yeah um I know as someone who's witnessed it firsthand, I struggle to believe it's real sometimes. And for uh, situations like the Epstein, where they uh, put out that documentary, I remember watching it and thinking, huh, I'm vindicated. Mm. You know, um, so that was kind of nice, but also kind of frustrating at the same time. Oh, okay. What was the frustration in that then? Uh, the frustration is that I am someone who's been speaking out for a long, long time. Mm. Um, and uh, there was no help. The psychiatric field really failed me in that. Um, you know, because uh, there's this thing in the States, I don't know if you have it there, it's called mandated reporting. And that is if you even suspect a child is being abused, you're supposed to call and report it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, I just think it's interesting that so many times people in the psychiatric field, not only was I harmed in their care, um, they always sent me home with the people I was telling them, I'm not really crazy. I'm trying to get away from these people. And uh, it's just, it's been a journey, man. <laughs> and life's like a movie for real. Yeah. It's like blockbuster movie stuff. Some of the hits stuff I'm hearing, you know, you just wouldn't believe it. I, I wouldn't have believed it until I started talking to survivors and, I'm like, that's actually where they get the ideas for these movies from. They're not coming from imagination. They're actually coming from real life scenarios. Mm -hmm. And um, it's all starting to come out now. Um, and so I'd really like to ask you about, you know, like that mistreatment with the psychiatrist and also, 
you know you mentioned the, the abuse with what other family members i, I imagine right there's that mm. okay yeah um but where would you like to start with it would you like to start right at the beginning or do you want to do you want to start with that with that where, where would you feel most comfortable um you know going into this well everybody's always said you should write a book and i was like <laughs> well i wouldn't know where to start so here we are uh, <laughs> okay we can um, work it out together no. then we can work out the chapters of, you know we can piece it together if you like together um so i i, I kind of want to mention that i didn't realize that i was being uh trafficked until i was an adult and i was speaking with um counselor I, they all they're all kind of a blur <laughs> but uh i remember she she said oh so you were trafficked <laughs> and I, I i guess that was the first time i'd really like considered that term being you know, so applicable to middle-class white girl. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it was always something that happened in other countries uh, far away. But then I, I got to looking at my experiences and realizing not only is it here and prevalent, it's, it's just prevalent. Um, so many children are being harmed. Um, and now they've got the MK Ultra. So, uh, so well it's science right so they're mass programming people through the media through ideas of, of the more you accept the more you tolerate and you know it's a lot um i feel like i'm a little bit scattered uh i uh speaking of psychiatry end of it i was the youngest person at the time uh diagnosed with did um that i guess they knew of i was put in a uh Dissociative Identity Program with uh, Dr. Mungazi in the Dallas-Fort Worth area where I was raised. Mm -hmm. um, but I was kidnapped multiple times and the people that raised me were not my birth parents. And um, there were times I was taken all over the country, um, hidden away. Um, I couldn't see outside my bedroom windows because they were covered. Um, I apologize. No, it's all right. Look, uh, and by the way, you know, part of the, the I, I understand this now, part of the recollection for people that have gone through, let's say, dissociative identity disorder and, and, and sort of traumatic stuff that you're going to go into it, it is a little bit scattered and it is sort of like very fragmented and it's sort of, it's not in a very, you know, it's not linear. It's, it comes in, in different pieces. So for anyone watching, please understand this. This is a raw, um, you know, uh, expression testimony. And so it's going to come out in that almost popcorn fashion of different bits. So um, we're just going to go with it though. You know, we're going to, we're going to try and, you know, as it comes out, that's how we're going to deal with it. But um, I would say how old, if you want me to just help, help us with the guiding of this a little bit, were you a child at this point? Because you mentioned, you know, you were an adult, um, you were trafficked as an adult. But right now, you, when you said you were kidnapped, was that as a child then? Uh, no, I was trafficked as a child, but um, I didn't realize that I was. Um, I didn't know what that meant. Mm. And uh, so, like, a, a, some, a third party had to bring that to my attention. Mm. And then that was how I learned that I was second generation trafficked. Um, that both of my birth parents before me were also um, trafficked as well. So. Oh, what? And then they they gave you to another set of parents then. Is that right? Oh, uh, they didn't quite give me. Um, my birth mother was staying with the people who raised me, mm. um, which was my birth father's mom and the man that adopted him. Mm. So. It wasn't going well for her. It was very abusive. So she took off back to Kansas with me. And uh, a few months go by and some relatives of that family show up. Just, oh, we wanted to, to see you guys and check in on you guys. And she stepped into the other room to make coffee. And when she came back, I was gone. And it was like a blizzard outside. And she says she called the police, but uh, no one uh, would help her which with the people who took me was funny enough, very different type of situation. Um, so they did some creative court circuitry mm. and uh, got it to where my birth father and them had um, 
shared custody. So my birth father, along with this underage pregnant girl, Mm -hmm. uh, is going to take me to Oklahoma and or somewhere we were headed to Oklahoma. And, uh, Basically, in the order, he could have me for this period of time. And he hadn't even crossed the border yet. The next thing you know, all these police cars are surrounding us on the interstate. I'm, I'm little. I'm in the back. I don't have a car seat. I don't know if we even had to have them back then at that age. But um, And I'm not knowing at the time that the lady in front of me is going to be my half-sister's mother and that she was only 14. So um, uh, next thing you know, helicopters are deployed. And I remember asking the woman who adopted me and raised me and trafficked me. Um, I remember asking her, uh, how are you able to do that? It's like the eighties <laughs> and like mm-hmm. late eighties, early nineties, maybe mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it was like 1989 ish. Um, mm-hmm. And she said, uh, well, it helps to have connections. And I just saw over and over again in my life, how those connections kept her and the people that worked with her mm-hmm. and uh, out of trouble. Mm. they're protected you mean untouchable yeah yeah mm. Mm. Um, and what did that network look like do you think how you know how 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 protective was it you know and how many layers of that was there mm-hmm. because um how deep does it go kind of thing well um so the biker gangs are shaking hands with the insurance adjusters mm. And the real estate agents, they all work together. Um, it's like, um, I, I'm a believer. So there's the body of Christ and all parts work together, you know, you know, jointly fit to serve a purpose. You work together, your fingers and uh, the ear have different functions, but they all work together. And that's kind of what it's like in these um, elite families. Um, it's about the bloodline, uh, keeping it pure and, um uh, really weird loyalty to one another so that when you're standing in front of them saying that one of them is forcibly using you and mm. you're only a child they say we can't say anything because we don't want to be alienated from the family and then over the years you realize it's the whole family the whole network is the family kind of thing yeah it's like um They've got someone in every field, you know, there's the one guy that's um, that that he works for the police uh, very extensively, like leads the SWAT team and Mm -hmm. um, does like a a lot of like undercover like investigations. There's that guy along with the person that's helping with the, you know, the insurance stuff and then um, owning stores and then uh, construction is usually a cover or it has been, you Mm -hmm. know, in my case. um, and then there's the, the biker gang and they all come together at the barbecue and do their little weird rituals and leave the children alone to be tortured and abused by someone. And then sometimes in groups, like I remember being at my grandmother's house around Christmas time and me and my little cousin who I was fiercely protective of. Uh, she was born very premature. She's only like two years younger than me, but like she was tiny. So I'd like pick her up and take her away and try to keep her from the bad guys, you know, but there's uh, memories of us uh, as kids out in this garage and all of these men are um, smoking and drinking and having to place our hands on the table while they played chicken. Mm. Um, That was terrifying. I still hate knives to this day. Uh, This would be the place that we would hear about how they were disposing of bodies. Um, Mm. You know, and then other horrible things that I, I don't know what I can say on your YouTube channel and not get you in trouble, but anything, um, anything you want. No, it doesn't matter for me. I mean, it just you you say what you need to say. If after we need to take anything out, we can take bits out. But I would just say from my side, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So uh, my grandmother's third husband, uh, he was uh, a Mason, uh, former Navy. Um, he told us from a really young age about Project Paperclip and MK Ultra and how he worked with those programs. Mm. Uh, his name's Jerry Latham. He's now passed. Um, but he would always tell me he was an original member of the Mickey Mouse Club mm. and uh, about his time in California. 
And um, one thing about my family I've learned is that they, it's like a, not a family tree, it's a family wreath, like the same families all like continuously like commingle and um, it's mm. weird because they're all like related. Um, so like um, Coopers and Clarks, for exa uh, example, just constantly going in and out like this and um not my Coopers, by the way, anyone. Want, you know? I, I know, I know. <laughs> and, I know. And um, my grandmother's maiden name is Cooper. Mm. And uh, mm. my name would have been Clark. But uh, anyway, so uh, the Coopers and Clarks just intermingle a lot. And uh, everybody I talk to that has like similar experiences. I don't I don't know. I'm sure there's other people out there that have different or similar experiences. But everybody I've met who's um, just we can relate to each other's passes. We're all um, Native American Cherokee tribe and um, uh, Scotch and Irish. Uh, and I think uh, German, German Jew. <laughs> um, so that's kind of weird because the Cooper name apparently was originally Kiefer and someone wrote a book about that side of my family. And that's where my grandfather who worked secret services for the army, he was on that side as well. Um, and his father was a Mason that built houses like all the way across the country and everybody just kind of like made it to California mm. and, um, got involved in the entertainment industry there. Um, well, there's others down South. I don't know. It's just very strategic when I look at the, look at my family and how they operate. But, uh, I would always call my grandmother's third husband, uncle Jerry which I've come to learn later in life that uncle is like a term that has to do with uh, men that will do things to children. They're introduced as uncle. Um, so he would always tell me about his friend Harvey having a crush on me, his friend in California named Harvey. And uh, one thing we were made to do a lot was uh, dress up like Shirley Temple Um down to like the ringlets in the hair and um, lacy ruffle butt underwear that showed because we were in these little short skirts and just sitting on the laps of men and entertaining them and singing for them. And uh, like there was this one time we were taken to a fishing tournament mm. and my cousin and I were each put on separate boats. And uh, basically we were being taxied to these various boats that were involved in this fishing tournament. And it, was then that we had to get off of the boat we were on and onto their boat and I think my mind is blocked out a lot of that but I just remember like sitting in their laps and singing for them and it couldn't have been great <laughs> you know mm. um I asked you know uh, I mentioned to you uh, this is why we got in contact about being uh underground at Epcot Center which is um part of the Disney parks in Florida okay um we were actually meeting with a man in this really nice restaurant, um, like five star, very exclusive, somewhere in the ball. Because um, at Epcot, there's this giant sphere like of interlocking triangles, probably their sacred stuff. But um, so we met and we spoke with this man, and then he took us to a place uh, where we got an elevator and we went down, I'm assuming. Uh, I don't really remember, but I do assume it's down because when we came out, it was almost like a, a sub level of a parking garage almost is how I would describe it, like the walls of it. And there was this really broad um, Robin's egg blue floor. Um, it, it wasn't like indoor flooring, but uh, it was, I, I don't know, uh, but it was just bright blue. Mm. And I remember it like slant, uh, angled downwards. And uh, we would pass different doors. And then we came to this really, I don't know, this grand door with like this architecture over it, you know, and you walked in and it was like a, a study. Um, and there was this old man in there and uh, I was made to reenact scenes from Shirley Temple movies for this man. Um, but my mom was upset. I call her my mom anyway. Uh, she was upset because I didn't get the role or something like that. So you're kind of 
um, this is actually a grooming process to then put you into sort of TV and en the entertainment industry. Is that kind of right? Is that right? So you would get abused and the ones that were um, the most what compliant or or favoured would then go on and work more for the for these men. Is that right? Yeah, in fact, uh, if I was better at keeping secrets, uh, I would probably have a much different life than I have now. Um, I might be working for the FBI, like my cousin, or, um, you know, managing, so, you know, basically this really nice cushy, here you go, if I went along with the things, but I didn't. Mm. Good Um, for you. Good for you. Moral compass, eh? well, um, so because of what happened, I can remember being very, very young. At ages most people typically don't remember it's part of the connection to the trauma um and i only know how young i was because i find photos and i see i'm like oh that was super young then and i you know um there's a couple of ex examples of that but anyway i was um very young and i remember uh wanting to plot the death of the people who took me and told me my parents didn't want me and allowed multiple multiple people to use me sexually from infancy through my adolescence, I wanted them gone. I I had a plan. Uh, I was going to poison the one guy and then hit her over the head mm. with this, you know, a, a terrible. Um, so I would practice sneaking up on her and uh, I would make sure I was a good cook. And to, 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 just to let you know, I was cooking and cleaning in the kitchen by the time I was four. So um, very much like a live in maid type situation. Um so one day, um, my father in heaven, I didn't realize that's who it was at the time. It's just, uh, it was this, uh, presence that was always with me, mm. um, said, why do you want to kill them? And I said, I don't want to kill them. I don't want to hurt anymore. So can you just kill me? I want to die. Mm. And, and some, somehow in that moment, like this, presence just like started showing me hope of a future um mm. gave me something to hold on to was there like every time I thought I couldn't go I couldn't carry on I would somehow just reach down and say you got this um I'm here and hold on um yeah mm. but it was very much uh groomed toward that but here's the thing they have multiple avenues if they can't use you in one they're going to use you in another so when they figured out oh well, we're not going to be able to control her in this way let's get her hooked on drugs right i see and uh introduce her to uh the, the lgbtq cult mm. uh you were doing I, I don't know if we can mention previous interviews but yeah yeah, yeah of course I, yeah I only watched the one because uh, it brought forth um, a slew of memories. I was like, I'll watch them all after, mm, but I, I just mm. can't like, I, I don't want to go into what we talk about uh, influenced by your other interviewers, because I do think that's what's greatest for me. It was very therapeutic to find uh, J.R. Sweet's interview mm. because we had so many things in common down to like our families were not really in the church, but they were in the church. Um, they weren't Mormon, but they read Mormon books to us in our childhood and they were part of the Mormon church. It's just, but, but they're not Mormon, but they are mm. um, more like plants, I guess I would call them plants. Yeah, it's a cover, isn't it? The more, the Mormon is just a, 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 a shield or what would you say? Um, a camouflage. Yeah. For this, for the CIA, FBI, whatever yeah. you want to call them that just, I, I feel like they're all the same alphabet agencies. Yeah. So what, what do you think then? Is it, is this, can I just summarize? Because I'm, I'm starting to also get a better idea with with all this now. Is that um, someone like yourself? Would you say your family is a satanic bloodline? Is it a very specific bloodline? Would you say? Um, I would say that it is. I, I, I've actually said these words several times mm. in the past couple of weeks. It's about the bloodlines. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I believe it somehow relates to, um, you know. Um, it's going to sound weird, but uh, the seed of Abraham and uh, the hatred for um, those who, you know, it's always been a war mm. really from the beginning of time, uh, but they hate us and 
they treat us like cattle, like slaves, and who do they use us until we... who do? Sorry, I just who hate you because if you were saying that you you are part of a bloodline, but are you saying it's a satanic bloodline or like a kind of more um, benevolent bloodline? I'm I'm still unsure about that bit. So when I was three, I was dressed up in a white rabbit outfit and taken mm. to a dark circle in the woods, right, uh, and filmed doing things and um witnessed some you know uh, i witnessed a murder there mm. uh, possibly two um can't quite be sure um i know there were two young ladies and then i saw the one um but um this was when i was really young like i said um three years old dressed mm. as a rabbit taken to the circle and filmed and but yet these people claim to be Christians. Like while all this is happening, I'm being very supervised and kept, but taken into the first United Methodist church, which I think is very suspect, uh, mm. at least here in the States, um, you know, uh, being put in private schools that are uh, Baptist and then more charismatic. So I also think that I was being groomed toward um, the evangelical side of things, just like uh, Kenneth Copeland and the Illuminati is like zero mm. degrees of separation. It's all about ritual and you don't get power and you don't get a voice unless you go along. And the that's what the contract is really is mm. how much you're willing to go against your moral, I guess, to achieve what you want. What's your price? Do you want to be numb and be high all the time here? We're, we're going to lure you in with the drugs or do you want fortune and fame? Okay. We're going to give you these opportunities, but these opportunities are going to include things that if you carry down this road, you're, 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 you're saying goodbye to your ethics. I'd like to ask you about that at some point. Um, is that how that even works? You know, why is it that you get the riches for going against your morals? Like I, I I'm still unsure why that is seems to be some kind of reverence to a uh, demonic realm or something that gives you yes. these things. But I wonder why, um, obviously you can understand from what I'm learning about this as I'm going along and it's seen, you know, it, it's, um, it's taking a lot for me to kind of get my head around it, but yeah, there's, it's as if they're, well, they call it selling your soul, don't they? Selling your soul to the devil. It's that, isn't it? You're, I don't know what that actual exchange is and what that looks like and what that means for that person, but is it, it there is that kind of return there's that trade of you will be propelled and you'll be given gifts and you will have the material wealth for doing this. But um, I'm still, you know, in that supernatural world, I'm still unsure how that will work. So I don't know if you've got any insights into that or maybe yes. we can talk about it later. Yes. Um, well, so they're Thalamus, first of all. So um, part of the reason like all of this uh, sexual stuff happens with the children is because um, they glory in that. Like they believe it's their right to be with innocence and the blood of the innocent. Like um, mm -hmm. it gives them power. Um, the, uh, wow. It's just, it's so uh, complex, mm. but uh, we're, we're basically vessels and we can be vessels for wrath or mercy. And when, when they break you like that and you, you do things against your morals, you're opening yourself up. To, you basically just become blind and numb until you're completely being led in the dark. And there's so many handlers that are right there to do it. Um, for Okay. So they like to gear people toward uh, Gnosticism. Um, uh, Edgar Casey, the great white brotherhood. Um, and what they're doing in, and, and it took me a while to figure it out. I was all about it. I was handing out copies of Sylvia Brown. Like, this has helped me so much. Um, but what they're doing is corrupting the truth of, you know, what we can have through uh, our connection with our father. So um, you're saying these prayers, basically, and these mantras and these meditations that you're opening yourself up to these other spirits. Mm. And that's a very dangerous thing to do. And if you're not actually opening your Bible and reading it, what they do is they'll post things that are kind of commonly heard and twisted a little bit, very subtly, and then try to make a whole new point that you are God. And uh, in the Christian faith, it says that, you know, uh, 
basically that the Antichrist is the one who sits in the temple. And we know that the temple is the body, right? The vessel. Um, so he sits in the temple showing himself that he is God. Um, mm. That's what connects to the LGBT stuff. I think you, what you mentioned before, isn't it? Like pride. Um, do you know if you put pride month side by side, the word demons right in the middle? I remember when I saw that, I'm like, how did I never see that before? It's because I, I had a reprobate mind. Yeah, pride, do D-E, D-E, D-E-M-O-N. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But it's that, though, is what you said. It, it's... Um, it's a deviation from the natural order and it's making yourself God and saying, I can do whatever I want completely at odds with the natural world. Um, yes. Meanwhile, all these spirits that you're inviting inside mm. of you mm. are just, you're losing your, it. Mm. Yeah. You're losing your, you're, you're losing your own, um, well, connection to the divine. If you want to even call it that it's just your connection to nature itself. That's how they keep us enslaved, really. Like, if you think mm. about it, the programming is geared in a way that makes people uh, oppose nature. Nature's dangerous. Nature is inconvenient. Mm. Mm. Um, we sacrifice a lot for the sake of convenience. Like, I can't believe people still shop at Walmart or order from Amazon. I mean, Etsy, mm. come on. Like, at, one, at some point, you got to draw the line. And then that people think you're weird for it. But there's consent is an important thing. Do we consent to uh, be basically walking experiments to a tyrannical government? Yes, we do. I mean, what mm. if we all just went out into the woods and grew our own vegetable? You know, you, that sounds kind of culty, but li literally um, when we weren't meant to mm. live in cement cities and step on each other to get our way to the top and work mm uh full time to have no time and to always be tired and always in debt and it's in a cycle that you do not break free from uh unless you sacrifice your ethics there is no avenue for it mm. yeah we're caught we're completely caught in that trap aren't we and they want it that way um so that we can't really expand our consciousness and move beyond that we're kind of stuck in this yeah, in this rat race where we're all fighting over this over the crumbs, I guess. Um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty lowly kind of existence, isn't it? I think there is changing though. I get the feeling that people are starting to question things a little bit more. And you know, you mentioned there about like growing veg, like um, that's the most rock and roll punk thing you can do these days is to like have your own uh, fruit and veg uh, patch. Yeah, I tell everybody if they're not like uh, growing vegetables and feeding chickens yet, they should have been doing it last week. Um, yeah. I'm not currently taking my own advice because I'm. Uh, I had to flee uh, my previous location uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but uh, before I crash landed in Springfield, Missouri, um, really corrupt place, by the way. Uh, and also there's an underground there. Uh, well, not underground. It is an underground, a well-known one. But um, before that, I spent about a year off grid living in a tent. And it was so amazing, like on this um, free range farm. I'd be walking down by the creek on my way to the cave. <laughs> and then like, I look behind me and like, I got goats and pigs and geese and they're all just following me wherever I go. It was like mm -hmm. literal paradise. And it was like really breaking out. Like I could get online and stuff. And I did when I would go down in, in, in you know, into town. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, it was just mm -hmm. very simple. Uh, I, I felt like literally like a Disney princess. I, like I'm walking around singing. Snow White. Here comes Caspi and the deer to say hello to me. Uh, <laughs> and I had a wow. baby skunk. Like who does that? You know? Oh my God. Wow. I was a full that, like... <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a skunk. I don't even know if we have, we don't have them here in Britain, but um, I just know it from the, the Disney character, but uh, Petty. Yeah, and I named him Flower after the Disney movie too. Go figure. <laughs> Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But you, you totally went off grid. So are you, um, was that because you, you, you're being targeted because you're speaking out against some of the stuff that's been going on? Is that the reason? Uh, well, first I tried to flee to Europe. I was going to mm. go live in Croatia. Oh, right, um, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's like, no matter where I go, people get injected into my life. And then I realized that they work for the government mm. or they're friends of the family. 
Um, and when I don't really go along with them or I go um, AWOL, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, they'll send people um, to punish me, I guess. Um, like, for example, once um, I... I stopped to see some people on my way out of town. They didn't want me to go out of town. So I was then taken to an apartment where I was drugged and um, assaulted for um, 19 hours about. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I'm like, Oh, these are just um, my friends screwing me over. How awful. But um, then I started to like really put the pieces together of how everybody was connected and it all started because my older cousin from my very first memory that I remember, uh, oh, sorry, second memory, because the first memory mm. was the day I was taken from my mother um, or around that time, um, probably because the trauma of that. Um, but the second one is me like being maybe one or two years old and he is doing stuff to me. So fast forward, uh, this cousin, it's all come out in the family that uh, he actually eventually moved on to raping me and allowing other people to rape me along with my other male cousin who was a, a little younger than him. Um, so, uh, and that cousin actually tracked on my other little cousin I was telling you about and tried to impregnate her. It's weird. It's about bloodlines. I don't, I don't understand mm -hmm. it fully yeah. because like I said, I don't keep secrets. So they stopped telling them, you know, I was basically uh, alienated from the family, if you will. Um, but he, um, man, even as an adult, he came into that house and impregnated a high school girl and nothing happened. Um, and then later they're like, uh, he's getting out of jail. And uh, how do you feel about him staying here? I said, well, I really don't want him to. Mm. Um, so I was a weed smoker, real hippie kid, you know, and uh, I would smoke weed with him when, he, you know, that's like the only way he could get me to hang out with him. And he's very love bomby, which was weird because he was very mean mm. growing up. And like, you know, so that was like you go and talk and smoke. And he even like apologized at this point for like all the, the things. And then it was just more things. But uh, so he's like, let's go get high. I'm like, cool. Yeah. So we go outside and he was like, I got to do this for you. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it turned out to be methamphetamine. And I had no idea. And he just said, it, it, it's different, but it's like weed. And it was not like weed. I suddenly was very panicked and couldn't imagine going inside with my parents and um, really uh, anxious and agitated. He's like, come on, let's go. We're going to a party. Mm. And nothing in me would have wanted to go to this party any other time. But I was like, okay. <laughs> mm. And we get to this party and, it's, and everyone there, uh, except for this, maybe a couple of people um, is gay. I don't know this at the time. Yeah. Um, the police show up at some point and there were minors there. So um, that didn't go well. I remember hiding in a closet on the patio until they left. And then I was introduced to a core group of people mm. that would continue to follow me throughout um, my early adulthood. Um, and Somehow I ended up at this apartment for two weeks and um, my cousin at this point is taken off with my car with the lady whose apartment I think it is. And then the next thing I know, my birth father is knocking on the door of this apartment and he comes in and he starts getting me high again too. Um, so I'm at a party fast forward with these core people Um and I uh, had just had my son, which was the only reason I was ever able to leave that alone. Um, mm -hmm. I had just had my son not long before that. And uh, it was a night out. And, uh, I went to this party. I don't know how I got invited to the party. That's There's so many like holes missing. Mm -hmm. But I know I was there. And uh, at this point, I know everybody's gay. And I am sitting around the circle of people and I was like, oh my gosh. And this girl next to me is like, what? And I was like, I just realized um, I'm gay. And they immediately broke out into chorus. They all stood up, mm. held hands and started swinging around me and started singing somewhere over the rainbow. 
And that really stuck out with me from JR Sweets because that is a trigger for real, for real. So were you also MK Ultra mind programmed then as well, like JR? Yes. You were. I, I was taken to an apartment uh, in California uh, where I was kept for six months. And I remember one of the things that um they would do, like it is weird because it was like a two bedroom apartment, when, like a table and chairs no living room furniture, no television. Uh, and there was like um, a mattress in the floor of one room and everything else is bare. And um, I'm like, when are we going to go home? And uh, I just remember being told that we can't leave until you find your doll. My favorite doll, Stephanie, had come up missing. And I just remember walking around for hours in this apartment mm -hmm. trying to um, find my doll. And it, there's like nowhere it could be. It's an empty apartment, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm a kid, like a really young kid. So it's, it, it all doesn't really make sense to me. But meanwhile, when we're not at this apartment, I'm being taken to these uh, rather nice uh, California mansions and attending parties um, with a bunch of older people mm. and doing like photo shoots and things of that nature. So, okay. So you were programmed as a, as a child then you were like a, as young as you could remember, you think. Um, yeah. That's when it happened. And that was, family doing that and uh, can we say what what that looked like the programming was it because a lot of the other guests i've spoken to jr talks about he it was a taser you know elect is like electric shock which you know threw him out of his body it made him disassociate was there i mean was it something like that for you uh that's where our stories differ a little mm. bit um i know i was electrocuted and burned um mm. But uh, I was actually just talking about this today uh, with my friend. Uh, the man who raised me had like, um, you know, he had this really uh, westerny belt with all this like big leather um, kind of woven into it, very mm -hmm. textured, um, painful. And he also had a yardstick. And I don't know if you know this, but plum tree switch will split the skin. And in the corner was a bullwhip. So there was usually something, whatever he was in the mood for. And then I was made to kneel on, um, there's like this metal piece between linoleum and carpet. Um, and it kind of like, it's kind of sharp on one end. If you hit it right, but I was made to kneel, uh, on that metal piece. And just for hours and hours, they would, um, try to tell me, yeah, I guess how to think like, I remember one time it was that I was supposed to hate black people like hours were spent on this. Um, it's third grade and I'm being told I have the wrong friends and I'm just a kid at school that's getting bullied because I'm very socially awkward and weird and fat. <laughs> so like it was just it, school was not a good experience for me. I, I was doing good to have friends at all. And here they are trying to tell me that. Um, my friends are, you know, the N word and that we don't, you know, you are what you hang with. And I'm just, mm. yeah, I, I, they couldn't program me that way. It just did not compute. Oh, so they tried, but they couldn't, you know? Yeah. Mm. So that's why, is that why you became alienated from the group? Because you were like a lot harder to program. Uh, I think it is. Um, so there was a man named Jack Wolf. He's still alive. I guess he's clinging. Um, not Wolf. Sorry. Wolf. Staten. Yeah. Sorry, I got say the name again. Sorry, I, I talked over you there. Sorry. Could you say the name? Jack Staten. Staten. Okay. Yeah. He's the man that um, I saw murder the girl and he was one of my abusers and he was kind of like a handler for all the kids. Mm. Um, he... So this is the funny thing. I grew up on the lake and then we had a boat. And for the longest time, I could never even remember having been on a boat. And I have all of these memories of being on a boat, but it took like the DID therapy to have these come back. So I know at one point we were, this is how I remembered it in DID brain, mm -hmm. uh, is we were on the boat backing into the water. And then all of a sudden we're pulling back up. Like we never went on the water. So that, that was erased somehow. Um, and I'd always ask about it. I'd be like, Hey, uh, why did we go to the lake that one time and back in and never go out? You know? And they're like, what are you talking about? Um, so through some of the therapeutic 
things of, you know, working through altars and uh, trying to, you know, not switch and confront Mm. the memories. Like a lot of stuff came back and I do remember being on the water. Now I remember it was me and Matthew and Chris, which were the older um, cousins, both of whom, by the way, now have a serve time for harming children. Um, uh, he had us there and he t- I remember he leaned in and he whispered and he said, do you know what's under there? And I was like, what? <laughs> Very little. Uh, and he's like bodies. And I was like bodies. And he said, dead people. And I said, why are they under there? And he said, because they couldn't keep secrets. So in the mind of a small child, here I am with this uncle Uh, telling me these things, but he has swam us several yards away from the boat and then proceeded. We were held under the water. Oh, you were drowned. You were like put into a a drowned scenario. Yeah. There were several times that that happened. So that, yeah, that was your, that was the way that they were programming you that like, that was the way they were torturing you, creating that traumatic based mind control yours was through drowning through like putting you under the water i feel like it was a series of things but yes that that was very um um, uh mm -hmm. (laughs) sorry to hear that well and the thing is too with these people is uh they threaten to kill you if you tell anyone Mm. and by the time you just don't care about yourself anymore and you actually would rather they did kill you (laughs) um then they start like they know what you care about and who you care about and um you know what's that thing called where people like uh care about their kidnappers oh uh, Stockholm, Stockholm right. Sundry- mm. yeah that's a real that. thing that's real i still struggle with that like i, I had a friend recently that was like if your mother did all that how can you even still talk to her and i'm like i don't really have another mother meanwhile i do i have a birth mother uh, mm. that i just wasn't able to know um mm. was done very dirty by the justice system and uh, but I was convinced from early age that they didn't uh, care about me. They didn't want me and drugs were more important to to them than I was. And that they weren't even trying to be a part of my life. And then at, when I was 21, a neighbor across the street uh, was like, hey, I want to tell you something. And she was like, you were in the eighth grade. And the counselor reached out to all of us because that was the first year I was able to go to public school. A mm. uh, counselor reached out to all of us asking if we knew you and we basically decided that we were going to leave it alone and not report it because they thought it would be worse for me in the foster care system than it was there. Um, they didn't really have the details of what all was going on there, although it may very well have been worse in foster care. So that was what first time I was let down by mandated reporters, I guess. Um, but she was telling me that that had been going on in that house forever. So mind you, I've been adopted by these people that are my birth father's mom and the guy that adopted him. Mm. Okay. Winds up adopting me. Although I would find out later in life, that was not a real adoption. Um, they had children that were um, grown seven of them. Um, well, the youngest was 14 when I was born. Everybody else was at 18. Um, so I just associated a little yeah, bit. So right. no, it's fine. Do you want me to help a little bit? Um, sure. So, um, well, maybe maybe if it's okay, just take a step back and we can come back on. Because I, I was going to say with so there was in summary that there was various levels of trauma that was happening to you, which created that disassociative identity disorder. And mm-hmm. then I'm, I'm guessing that they were programming the alters, were they, and within you with different tasks or like assigning certain roles to those alters. Is that how it worked? You know, I wish I could remember to tell Mm -hmm. you, Um, Mm -hmm. I don't really remember being programmed other than like the times that I was taken to these offices. Um, uh, Taken to these offices to, to meet with, I don't even know who they were. I just know that uh, when I look back in my mind's eye, it was definitely some kind of government thing. I know I was being tested for my intelligence um, and part of all of these various programs that were monitored by 
um, the government and one of them wound up, I wish I knew the name of it, uh, wound up uh, monitoring my son, which I never would have approved of, but they were trying to steal him from me like they stole me. And uh, so I was just like in this battle of, you know, so someone, his stepmother, um, she is his stepmother now, um, but she uh, put on the form that she was his mother and signed to approve of this. And mm. so I, I don't know, there was just like, there was testing and there's like weird memories that cut off. Mm. Like I do know that uh, there was a time I was strapped to a barber's chair in front of a television um, and I was constantly made to watch. Uh, and this is another thing people I, I meet with that have similar uh, accounts of growing up, having common, constantly made to watch uh, very scary, gory movies from an early age and pornography. Why do you, do you think there's any reason for that? A uh, grooming, probably. I mean, if you've got this child that um, you're using sexually and taking money to please other people for, mm. um, you would do it. But the funny thing was, like, mm. it, it was like they would put it on for us to make us watch it. But then someone else would come in and like, we got in trouble for it. Like they were encouraging us to... Uh, engage in sexual encounters with one another. But when it came out, we got in trouble for it. And then find out from the neighbor across the street that it's been going on for years. Oh, that my cousin might actually be my brother because my birth father's older sister was messing with him and the math maths. Hmm. Yeah. So this was, um, are you saying that this was going on in the, in the whole neighborhood then did you just say did i hear no. that right no no the the neighborhood lady who had lived there for like all these like 21 years yeah uh, well more than 21 years because i was 21 at this time but she basically she used to watch me when i was little mm. um so uh sorry um, she had called me over and told me that she wanted me to know that my parents, at least my birth father did fight for me and that they had lied to me and that she couldn't understand why my parents were so evil. And that, you know, that had been going on for years. And I was like, well, we tried to contact the authorities to get records because we had uh, this reporter who was going to do the whole you know, blow it out of the water because we couldn't get help. We'd go to the police and they'd say, oh, call these people. We call these people. They say, oh, call these people. And no one could ever do anything, apparently. Or in si situations where um, cases were filed, like when I was taken for two days and held in that apartment, they just disappear. Like you called a check on it, mm. you know, hey, where are we at? And they're like, this case doesn't exist. Mm. I mean, um, the last time I feel like my family sent someone toward me, uh, uh, I was sent an uh, undercover narcotics officer for the city of Fort Worth who drugged me and raped me and got away with it. They didn't even press charges. And I had literal text messages where even in my drug state, he's trying to get me to go in his room with him. And I said, no, that's not appropriate. I'm going to stay out here in the living room. How old were you then? Sorry, just so I get uh, it. This was uh, actually the most recent um, mm -hmm. So I was an adult when this happened. Mm. Uh, 2021, maybe. Oh, right. Wow. So this is really still going on now. Like the, you, you're being targeted and they're still trying to get to you. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> why won't they leave you alone now in your adulthood? Is there any reason why they still want to sort of mess with you? Uh, probably because I, um, decided it would be a good idea to be a content creator <laughs> yeah. and, uh, started posting about various things. Um, so there was always like kind of this, um, struggle to keep me to myself. So I don't talk to people. So mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to go to sleepovers. They had to send home a note and say, look, everybody in the world has the internet. You need to either get internet or take her to go get internet, you know? So everything I did was very, uh, controlled. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, when it came time that I could leave, um, mm -hmm. it was like they would send people into my life to intercept. And it took a, a while, you know, of 
this happening and say, hey, who are these common denominators? Who's connected to who? And mm-hmm. how did I meet them? Were they at that original party where my family tried, um, you know, it, it was... <sighs> Mm. And whose birth father shows up to an apartment he doesn't know exists and holds, you know, drugs to his daughter's mouth. It's so bizarre. Mm. Um, so much to take in, isn't there? I mean, it's just overwhelming, like everything that's gone on and then trying to make sense of it all. Plus, it's just so um, heinous, everything that happens. It's the brain almost can't, the mind can't even process it just because it's just so just, yeah, the most awful thing ever. You know, like some of the stuff that you just couldn't imagine goes on actually going on that I, I don't, you know, I, I can imagine why you disassociate from it. Even just, mm. even if you didn't have that disassociative disorder, it would be quite easy for people just to block that out. Like, you know, with put some kind of firewall that off, you know, that those thoughts and those memories. So um, yeah, you've gone through a lot there. You've really gone through a lot. Okay. Can I ask then something you said earlier, can, can we talk a little bit about Epcot? Cause I know that's something that you've mentioned a few times to me. Um, I couldn't I didn't really understand so Epcot is a is a town is it or in America what is Epcot it's a Epcot Center it's like uh, one of the parks owned by Disney oh it's a Disney park okay and you say it's um, so it's within Disney Florida so what's that Disney World Orlando Orlando so it's in Orlando yeah I don't I don't really know I'd always get them mixed up as a kid because we went to both of them quite often Okay. And um, so you said that as a child, you were taken underneath um, Epcot. Um, Would you like to talk about what happened there? Like, what was that about? And who took you down there? Family or the handler? Do you have handlers? Mm. Well, uh, my mom was uh, a handler. The one, it's so funny because I call her my mom. The lady who kidnapped me and faked my adoption (laughs) was my handler. Um, and she kind of answered to the lady in California, which was her aunt, which was the sister of the brother who works secret services. Um, so her dad, I guess. So her aunt. Um, so that was who programmed me much like um, J.R. Sweet was talking where he was taken to this apartment and off, you know, at a military base. That's kind of like where our stories correlate there. I do believe like I've come to the full realization. That's who was t- navigating my handler on where to go and where to take me. Mm-hmm. Um, to get these jobs. Um, but uh, she, the lady who raised me that I call mom, mm-hmm. uh, had taken me there. And like I said, we were just, uh, we weren't in a place that was like normal park. It was like there was a, a city there um, in this huge, I don't know if you can see it online, but there's a giant uh, sphere and inside of there, there's like, I mean, you wouldn't believe. <sighs> mm. I don't know. But somehow we go in and we're in this restaurant. And the, there's uh, booths that go all the way around um, where you can see out through these windows. And we're like up in this little VIP booth. And uh, my mother is like, just, I have to sit up straight. You know, I'm like going through the t- checklist with me of, you know, making sure I'm presentable when the man in the suit shows up and um, they ordered me a Shirley temple, the drink. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I remember that's when I found out what it was. Cause it was my first time to have one and I really liked it. Uh, and then uh, they spoke for a while while we ate. And then we were guided by the man in the suit to this elevator where we went down underground. And like I said, um, we were taken down this hallway that kind of sloped even deeper. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like cement walls all around. You look like you're in like the sub level of a parking Mm -hmm. garage, but this door opens up to this wall on wall shelves of books and like those nice ornate desks and some green velvet sofa over here. And Mm -hmm. this man looks, I don't know how to describe him. He's an older man with white hair and, He's got on um, a suit, but he's also got these medals on. um, And uh, all I remember is just basically I had to do the Shirley Temple routine. And Mm. there's parts I don't remember. I don't remember what happened after that. Mm. That that is the connection with JR's story, because he was saying that he was taken underneath the park, Disneyland, you know, and there was like military Mm -hmm. uh, high profile 
people there, celebrities as well, um, that were part of the program. He mentioned Leonardo DiCaprio as well. That name keeps popping up quite a lot. Um, but there was others there as well. And I think you also mentioned the Mickey Mouse Club because he said that that was part of it as well. And um, you have some insights into that, don't you? The Mickey Mouse Club, for instance. Um, I think you said your family member was a part of that, did you say, or knew about it? Yeah, he would always say he was an original member of the Mickey Mouse Club. Um, okay. And who? I wasn't who? sure. Sorry, who? <laughs> Which member? Sorry to interrupt, but. This is my grandmother's third husband, not the one that worked secret services for the army, but he worked, he was in the Navy and claimed that he worked on these projects. Um, so I just kind of didn't really know how to take it. He also was grooming me toward the music as well. Mm -hmm. Um But I was when it was in his obituary, I was like, oh, okay, this is something that, you know, um, it wasn't just something that he said because we were kids, I guess. But this man, was, he would sit me on his lap and talk to me for hours. I can't even tell you about what I, I really didn't like him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I would always call him Uncle Jerry. And uh, people are, that's, uh, mm -hmm. and I knew he wasn't my uncle. So I didn't know why I kept calling him that. It just came out like automatically. I guess. And um, he, whenever I would stay there, which was frequently after dinner, would always take me outside while my grandmother did dishes in the window. Mm -hmm. And there were these bushes that uh, came up with about mm, two or three foot between those bushes and the fence mm -hmm. to the neighbor's house. So on the other side of the bushes, grandma can't see through the window. But every time we would go there, the neighbor would be there. They would talk for a while. I would pet the dog. And then uh, I would be made to urinate in front of this neighbor. And he would hand cash to And That's one of the memories, mm. I guess. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Mm. And um, what, what is the Mickey Mouse Club, would you say? Like, what is that? What is it? Have you, do you know? I think it's all a psyop. Cable television, the entertain entertainment industry, um, even the internet. Like it brings people together and it helps us get knowledge like really fast and it's all in one place. Mm -hmm. And we can learn things so quickly that would take us so much longer to do without it. But what has it done? But it's made us um even more isolated than we were before. We we feel more connected, but we're not because we're put into these algorithms and put into these echo chambers and we're still being separated and mm. no one's coming together really. Like they come together in mind and in heart and spirit online, but who's like, who's meeting up out there to say, hey, cause I've been online. I'm like, Hey guys, I'm seeing illegal stuff happen. I'm not, you know, what happens mm. on the street is awful, but usually lawful. But because of what I've been through and experiences in the place I was taken to do these things, I I'm able to find them sometimes. Uh, it's more often than not. And um, I investigate them and I report them online, mm. um, but no one's coming together to, to, to do no. anything. But and then you call the police and mm. it's like, our, 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 our uh, sources are limited, but my experience with the police is they're in on it. Yeah, they are. I think in every institution at the top level, they're all corrupted. They've all been compromised at the highest level of every single institution. Um, I still think there's good people within those institutions, but they just never gravitate to the top positions that control right. everything. Um, but can I ask, what is that the same as Mickey Mouse Club, though? Because, the, you know, the Mickey Mouse Club is a very specific thing. And, you know, like Britney Spears and um, Justin Timberlake were like kids that were part of that. Oh, no, that was the was that the Mickey Mouse Club Disney Club or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they, they were groomed through that as, from a young age. I'm wondering whether the Mickey Mouse Club is that, is that like a cover name for MK Ultra and like the, those Aguileras and the Britney Spears? They were like products. Well, it's all connected, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess that's not obvious for everybody. I feel like it should be though, <laughs> like because uh, the entertainment field um, is how we influence people, influencers. Yeah. Um, so they want to be able to influence the influential and control who has the influence, and that's yeah. part of how they keep us enslaved and constantly trying to claw our way to the top. And, mm. you know, um, so yeah, I, I believe that Disney itself is probably, like, yeah, I, I hate to call it the CIA, but I guess they're in, vol uh, in charge of the paperclip and the, the um, MK ultra, but who, who was it before they were the CIA? 
I can't answer that. I just know that this is generational and it seems to have been going on for thousands of years. Um, mm. if, if they can't uh, convert you, they want to corrupt you. Um, and if you're not corruptible, like you either stay out of the way or you wind up dead. Yeah. Or run away, which is what you've done, you know, <laughs> like try to get away from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, how, I just I want to check in with you. Are you okay? Are you, do you, do you, you know, do you want to wrap, do you want to sort of bring this to a close and then we can do another part another time? Or do you want to do another 10 minutes or something? What would you, what, what would feel good for you? I feel like I've uh, been a little all over the place. All I'm right. a little disappointed in that because uh, I really stewed over a lot of the things, you know. Um, but at the same time, it is very difficult with yeah. someone who uh, has uh, the DID to really tell, like you said, a linear story. And there's just truly mm -hmm. so much. And I, I don't know if my telling my story is going to help anybody, but I know it was very helpful to me mm -hmm. to hear your interview and to know that I wasn't the only one having those experiences that, you know, I'm very interested to know if someone's church took them to a boy's ranch and left them alone as young girls with these uh, boys um, mm. after speaking to a psychiatrist at uh, Baylor University or any, I, I'm interested to know uh, about that. So I think uh, part mm. of what we go through is so surreal and so uh, unimaginable to someone who hasn't really been through it or seen it or known someone closely who's walked it, you know, it's just so out of this world and that's how they want it to be. That's how they want us to think when it's really happening right under our noses in our historic downtowns by the churches, you know, the church, oh my gosh, it's so corrupt. I refer to my faith a lot, but uh, it's not because of the church, uh, you know, not that every church is bad. I'm not trying to say that, but um, I guess for me, like, like I said, I just want to help even one. And if, if I can, that would be great. So I try to um, bring awareness to these places, what they look like, where you're likely to meet someone who wants to purchase a child. Um, you know, uh, the, it's just so much. Um, mm. I had to flee uh, another place because I had witnessed some things and I was being threatened by the U S government. Oh, right. Um. You know, I had a, a E9, uh, whatever his title is, um, Secret Services Army man approach me and start immediately showing me pictures of corpses. Um, people that understand the MK Ultra uh, programming more than myself have said that that was likely SOS programming, which is why I couldn't really remember the conversation I had with this man, even though I remember him. He showed me his ID. That was our introduction. Um was showing me the corpses and then his ID. And that's basically like a normal sane person mm. would probably be scared into not talking about the things that they're talking about online. Cause I do, I share everything that I see online. Mm. Cause if something happens to me, I want other people to be able to pick that up and care. I'm just one person, you know, um, yeah. I can only do so much, but if I get the truth out there and I raise awareness, then, you know, maybe more people can come together and help. So, um, I don't know. Uh, the more I, I do that, the more I get targeted. Then the more you get targeted, yeah. And was that army officers? That they just was that recently? Then or did they just approach you on the street, just randomly out of nowhere? Uh, that was recently. There was a place I was investigating. Um, uh, for now, I, I want to keep that private because authorities are looking yeah, into yeah, it. Sure. Um, but basically, uh, another thing Jr. mentioned is like they can have a whole bar full of people, and it's just them. They all work together. Oh, like a drinking bar. You mean there's like places they go to socialize? Yes. Mean? Right. Yes. And before I understood like the fullness of what was going on, I was joking and I told my sister, I was like, it's kind of like um, the place where the, the the bosses go for like the various little crime syndicates. Mm. It's where they all go to commingle and then the rich people go there to get what they're looking for. Um, okay. So they can supply them. So it's almost like they they're like the real mafia then. And they, if people want wealthy people want something, let's say they want children, they can, they provide it for them. And that's where they go to make the trade. Yes. Wow. Would you say that all these people, they are all bloodlines or would you say some are just corrupted people or just, um, how would you say power hungry people in your experience? Or would you say it's like the movie, they live. I don't know if you've seen that with Roddy Piper, but there's like a certain amount of people that are, when he puts the glasses on, he sees them all as, you know, some kind of off-world, 
like um, creature, you know, demonic creature or something like that. Would you say they're all like that? Or would you say that, you know, it does also attract normal, not normal bloodlines, but non satanic bloodlines that just want a piece of the pie? You know, they want that power. Well, first of all, there's more of us than there are them. People that are fully uh, possessed to, to Luciferianism, the, the lama that they've just sold out completely to all of the the immoral things, like the killing of people, the 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 raping of children, all these things that you do, it does something to yeah. you spiritually, uh -huh. mentally. The people that are fully sold out like that, um, I think they're. I feel like there's more of us than them, but yet they have more power and they're more prominent because we're all in our houses. We're, we're not in our communities uh, where a lot of this is targeted. Like I'd say growing up, I understood how this worked from uh, upper middle class up to the top. Cause you find out that your father's working for Clinton's brother and trafficking people, you know, uh, versus, and now after observing this situation, I see how it works all the way to the bottom where they're mm. uh, coercing women, um, young girls, college kids, to um and these are professors of their university are their handlers now at the bar where they're being pimped out and they are full on under mind control the children it's, yeah i i, I suspect yes because yeah. I, I have seen in these places um some some weird child exchanges uh as long along with um some of these people that are at these places don't look like they're old enough to be there yeah i've heard that through a lot of the interviews that I've had, that's been a, a, a recurring theme there. And it's that those children tend to be brought up in those families as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I wasn't, uh, I, I was one of those children in the bar, mm. uh, 16 years old in wet t-shirt contests. Like, well, like <laughs> I mean, no judgment ladies, but yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not who I am. So I have to wonder what happened that I did that. Cause it, it's never been who I am. Um, I've always been a very prude and kind of modest type. Mm. Whereas my cousin who endured much of the same as me went to the very promiscuous, um, wild, um, uh, she was programmed for a while deeper. So she, she was in the, uh, Aryan brotherhood and being, you know, groomed up for that. Uh, so we went very different directions. So I guess that's another thing people should know is it affects different people differently. Um, I don't know. I just lost it again. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm that's trying okay. to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah I would I'll, love to yeah, talk to you more about stuff. We can talk more about what I'll do is I'll read out the bullet points. And then if there's anything that you feel like you really needed to say, you can say, it. if not, we can leave it for another part. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, you said different travels after kidnapping places, trafficked, AKA childhood experiences, bloodline connections. Were there any, were there any, did this connect you that, did you notice any connections to sort of um, presidents or, you know, powerful yeah. Yeah. I'm related to the Adams presidents. Oh, right. And also to Chief John Ross. He's not a president, but he was the leader of the Cherokees um, in the late 1800s. Oh, you're connected to John Adams, who's like the second uh, American president, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think they were the second. It was a uh, father and son, both of them Adams. But you say so you had George Washington was the first then John Adams was the second and Thomas Jefferson was the third. Right. So John Adams is the that you were connected to his family. Right. I think there are three. Were there three Adams? Because there was a father and son who both served. Um, as feel... I don't think it was back to back. But... Oh, so it's not that it wasn't that Adams that we're, we're talking about. There's another one. Right. Listen, this was not my strong suit in school. Okay, don't, like, worry, don't worry. The presidents. No, no, no. I barely got uh, through uh, the case. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, let me, I can have a look now just out of interest. Um, mm. John Adams. Yeah. Uh, it was the, the second yeah president of the United States. Oh, John is John Adams related to John Quincy Adams. Probably. I know that sounds so weird. I, I have not looked into it. I just know that this is something that the family has said over and over again on my birth mother's side is that we were related to the Adams presidents. And there yeah, were two John, of them. Yeah, John Quincy Adams was served as the sixth president of the United States. That's so yeah, because they weren't back to back. Yeah, yeah. So it's that one. So you were well, you relate to both, really, but um well, and if you listen to some people, uh all of the presidents are related. So yeah. 
Well, no, but they're related. John Adams is so John Quincy yes, Adams father, is son. the son of John Adams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So yeah, you, you're related to both of those. So you're related to the Adams family. Um, yes, I've lost my. It's interesting. And the Stuarts. And the and the Stuarts. Mm -hmm. Who were they? Uh well, uh, that that's from the Scotch side, uh, the royal bloodline, I guess. Oh, you mean um, in England, the royal family mm -hmm. from England, the Stuart, the Stuart House, the House of the Stuarts. Um, that's what I've been made to understand. Yeah, um, but I just know that my family's bloodlines that all work together are the Coopers, the Clarks, uh, the Stuarts. <laughs> this is all like you the know, most common last names. You know, it's really strange. There's actually a person called John Cooper Clark. He's a, like a famous poet here in uh, England. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of relationship. Yeah. There. Mm. Um, but I won't do a 23 in me, so I guess I won't find out. Well, just so everyone knows, um, Cooper is a popular name. Um, so please don't think that I'm. It is. It's very. It's People very will think I'm part of like some kind of. I don't know. They'll call me Illuminati now, Freemason or something. We might be related. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Um, but would you say though that just because you're part of a bloodline doesn't mean that you go on to do bad things? I think everybody does bad things at some point, and I think that mm -hmm. there are people that, whether they're still children or even young adults. Um, that can absolutely change and get out. Mm. Um, it was always my main mission. So, uh, but I don't think I could have done that alone. I really do attribute so much to my faith because I know that is what saved me. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think just because you're born mm. into this, that you're necessarily going to be awful. In fact, like I was telling one of the handlers uh, at that place um, that I mentioned earlier, where everybody in there is like either working for the government or part of a gang or leading the Masons. Like it's where they go to convene for special things. But um, I was, uh, it's like, I, I was speaking to one of the handlers and um, I said, you know, it's funny because my native American roots that call this the trail of tears, because by the way, they do a lot of their trafficking along the trail of tears, uh, which is, you know, what's that? what's the trailer to um, a road well yes and no um there's markers on several roads all up and down close to historic route 66 um but uh it was the path that the cherokee people took when they were pushed into the indian territory and then further down into mexico okay so, so there was a lot uh, of what there so you said there was a lot of what on that trail trail of tears a lot of trafficking trafficking like oh, you I can see. find very many hubs along historic route 66 where there's a trail of tears so i was speaking to this woman yeah. and um we both know that we're something they don't know what i am because like um i'm not one of them but i've had enough programming that somehow like i assimilate when i'm in these groups of people and that's very dangerous too because i made the mistake of boasting that i couldn't be programmed and a normal person is going to be like what are you talking about programmed mm -hmm. uh but this person says are you sure and and so, uh, and then proceeded to prove to me that, no, I still can be manipulated. Uh, mm. um, but anyway, um, I was speaking with her about how in, in our ancestry, because uh, she was speaking about uh, different areas, like in Arkansas, calling to her Cherokee uh, past. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I know the past is here, too, but I feel it much more in Arkansas. But then it like hit me. My same ancestors that were being driven down the Trail of Tears and uh were were like literally the same not same exact ancestors but my other set of ancestors are the ones that are building these masonic temples all along the way so it's like i have both in my history and i i feel like a lot of people uh i've talked to that have had these experiences do have both um the afflicted uh ancestry side and then the ruling class side and it's really all comes down to decisions and consent at the end of the day Mm. and you would say that that was it Cherokee that that kind of native Indian side within you is benevolent it, it's it's you know it's good it's there's a good side to it. or would you say that's still some kind of um I don't want to use the word demonic but you know what I mean it has that um malevolent force behind it negative force I think like you said there's uh good people in yeah. everything 
Yeah, they, okay. they don't necessarily always make it to the top, but they always seem to be there when you need them and mm. help you get through. And it's like a balance, really. Um, so we have choices. And so they 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 coexist. Um, re- both realities are true. I come from people who mm. built temples that sacrifice and exploit children. And I also come from the people who were sacrificed and exploited. Yeah. The, the choice is um, mine at the end of the day. Do I live my life in accordance to what's being done to me or do I live my life in a way that I wish had been done to me? Mm, I love that. Yeah. And I thank you for so much for, you know, having the courage to talk to me and come forward. And I know it's not been easy and, um, but you've been brilliant, you know, and it's okay that things are coming to you. I know you, you it seems that you're a bit frustrated before you said it's coming to you because you probably all had it all thought out and then it's come to you in different bits, but that's, you know, it's totally fine with me. You know, this is what a raw conversation is. It's like, it's, it's not meant to come out in a polished fashion, you know, all nicely prepared. I mean, this is like the first time you're really getting it all out there. So it's going to be a little bit messy and a little bit chaotic, but um, this is the process that you're going through to, you know, making sense of all of it and healing from it as well. So, um, you know, I, this is perfect. You know, it's just exactly how, as it's meant to be. It's authentic. So we can, you know, I just say so we can do another one as well, you know, and we can always do when things make a little bit more sense. We can even do a summary again, if you like. It's totally fine. Okay. And um, I'll just read out the others just so you know. You also mentioned MK Ultra DID. We spoke about accounts of how government entities stalk, harass and attack you as a targeted individual. You mentioned yeah. that. And your current fight to raise awareness and expose the trafficking that's happening right now in front of us, a.k.a. hidden in plain sight. Yeah. In churches and institutions that we see on our high street shopping place. malls really shopping malls yeah um the schools like it's it's most people wouldn't believe how connected and and nefarious it really is like the homeless man downtown is a lookout for the guy that lives above the bridal shop who gives the signal when it's okay to bring the child in the van to honk to let people know it's for sale it's happening right there downtown like I said, it's, it's all about what we sacrifice for convenience. If you want to like see the depth of the corruption, just take a trip to that unconvenient place downtown, maybe on a crappy weather day and just watch what's going on. I mean, you know, you're just in a public place, you know, uh, so maybe you're a tourist and film a little bit and you'll, you'll notice people are looking at you weird because it's at least here along historic route 66. Um, and even outside of those places, there are many locations like this where, um, you know, they are their art and their symbols really like that people say it'll be their downfall. I don't know. I haven't seen that yet, but it definitely gives them away. And it is a code that they use. So, um, gosh, I spoke to John Wedges, the detective, and he said, um, the homeless people can act as spotters and lookers. So they'll, they'll abduct children off the streets, um, mm-hmm. and they'll be passed on. And the, they'll be called the fixers, the ones that are co- coordinating with, like, let's say, the homeless people on the streets. And um, they'll abduct the children and then they'll fix up the the parties or whatever, the venues. And then they go to these venues for these Event people. centers and hotels. Like- yeah. Mm-hmm. And he also said the, the foster, you know, like the foster care system and the care homes are basically they pimp out these children. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, they make money from that. And then these children are pimped out from the care homes. And there's like a kind of a trade going on there. Uh, yeah. Even charities, you can't trust the children's charities either. Um, you, you know, it's. Oh, there is one thing I wanted to say. Yeah. All right, um, go on. <laughs> in case, because we can't predict life. Yeah. Um, but, uh, okay. So I remember when a lot of people were coming forward. And I, I'm terrible at names. I, I think it's something they did to me, honestly. Um, this, uh with the name thing and probably all the trauma, but there were people that came forward sharing their experiences of being hunted and witnessing these murders and, and being part of these rings. And this is all very real, but I know where they lose a lot of people is when they start talking about how the faces turn into demons. Mm. But I want people to understand that these are memories of a small child who has probably been drugged is at a ceremony where at first she's looking at the people that she's supposed to be able to trust and love. And then the next thing, you know, they're in masks. If I didn't have the photos from, um, from, from that uh, circle ritual I told you about on Halloween when I was three uh, where that lady got killed. um, If I didn't have that, like I would have just thought 
they really did turn into monsters and demons. Mm. And that is done to discredit. It's the kind of like a fail safe because we're programmed not to say anything, not even to, you know, cry or scream sometimes, but that's like a fail safe for when you break programming to um, basically discredit you. Cause who's going to yeah. believe that? Yeah. Cause there is talk of that, like um, what do they call it? Shape shifting and stuff like that. Um, I mean, it could go on, right? But who knows? But um, but you're right. It, that's a way of discrediting. As soon as you mention that, it's a way of discrediting the whole thing. So suddenly paedophilia has then just been thrown out as like that has to be conspiracy theory um, yeah. by just equating it with that. Yeah. Yeah. But I do want to say while a lot of it is being drugged and these masks in these yeah. ceremonies, I have seen demons manifest in these people. I've seen people with blue eyes turn so, uh, solid red and solid black. Uh, and it's like almost speaking to like this ancient creature through it's it's really i don't know how to explain it unless you've witnessed it yourself other than that person that you've known your whole life isn't even that person anymore there's something else entirely and every now and then you can kind of talk to them and reason with them and it's like the eyes go back but then i don't know oh, <laughs> i've seen that's... it happen so many times well, just talking normally, like, you know, just about your normal day and then suddenly they'll switch and then the eyes go. Uh, this is usually when uh, more violent things are occurring because mm. uh, somehow, like, even though the violence is being done, like, there's a person in there somehow. Mm. But I don't know. And, and I'm such a pacifist and I want to understand. So while I'm being held for 19 hours by this guy, I'm also like, you realize what you did to me since I've known you all this time is illegal in all these states. Yeah. And then he gives me the sob story and I feel sorry for him. And as he's giving me the sob story, his eyes are blue again. Mm. But then when he starts to attack me again, they've gone back to red and black. And, and I'll say this and wrap it up. Cause I'm sorry to keep you. But um, the moment that I saw this happening, I was like, this is a demon. And he acknowledged me. I didn't say it out loud. I was like, oh, and he's, I, I can't even do it, but yeah. it was like, very like, the eyes said it. He, he he knew that I recognized him. And immediately I saw the faces of all the multiple people who had raped me from early, early childhood on. Um, and I saw those same eyes looking back at me and I was like, it was you the whole time. And the acknowledgement came again. So I do believe there are familiar spirits that these people can, they want to call it programmed, but uh, have entered into people. And um they're not the same. The person, Gary, who I grew up with and worked with and was my best friend's older brother was not the same as the person who was attacking me. And the eyes weren't even the same. So, yeah. yeah it's, like, they, it's like the movie Nefarious, isn't it? I don't know if you've seen that, but it's exactly mm -hmm. like that, right? Exactly like that. You know, just for anyone that hasn't seen that movie, this guy's on death row. Death row? Yeah, his, this guy's on death row and um, he has been possessed by a demon and he's having this conversation um, with this guy who has to decide whether or not he's crazy and should go into a psych ward or be killed. And um, he flips between the original person, let's just call him Dave because I can't remember his name, and the demonic person. And mm -hmm. um, he totally changes character in the movie. Like you could see his body language, everything's different. So you're saying that that happens. And then you, so you knew that that demon, that demonic entity had been in all those other people that had raped you, that same one entity. Yes. Wow. And you saw the faces of the, all the people, the, the vessels of the, hu the human flesh, the, the bodies that did it. Yeah. It's like, as I, I'm like, I'm looking at you now. Mm. Uh, I have like this flashback, like a movie playing, like I can still see you in front of me, but mm. I also see like all those faces, you know, um, over me and I'm looking up and I'm like, and then I look at, you know, at the eyes and I'm like, oh, it's you. And I get the acknowledgement kind of just like a nefarious when you know that creepy smile playing and the mm -hmm. you know I don't even know like I can't even begin to mm. recreate it but it, it's um wow it's crazy how weird life is I say it's like a movie and people are like oh which movie I'm like all of them at once all at the same time yeah. and X Files is <laughs> and all those TV shows as well like sci fi and everything else is just like yeah. Um, it's really, really like blockbuster movie type stuff that you just can't believe. I think that's how they get away with it. It's because it's so far out. It's so beyond what people can imagine goes on that 
that's also what gives it protections because people think that's just got to be fake. Like, there's no way that happens because we're kept in a little bubble sized, a pea sized um, awareness of what goes on in reality. So, you know, it's so wacky that it immediately gets written off and that's how it continues because it will never get challenged because it's like, well, that's just not going to, you know, they just think that can't happen. So, um, yeah, it's another fail safe mechanism, isn't it? Um, Let me ask you something. If mm. I told you that last week I witnessed a van full of five children uh, uh, with a Romanian mother that were being uh, advertised at a gas station and that I was chased by multiple vehicles and threatened with my life, would you believe me? Well, I would now. Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but most people won't. No, God, you've got to take, you've got to finish off with that one. Or yeah. do you want to leave oh. that a cliffhanger? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, we're leaving it for a cliffhanger? No, I'm you... saying, like, we, I, I, I want to know what happened now. Just quickly, <laughs> what was that about? Uh, well, we weren't actually even looking, and that's what I mean by it's it's so prevalent. It's mm. everywhere. Um, we were going to go to the store, and uh, my friend's son had fallen asleep in his car seat, so we kind of just drove around a little bit. I'm new to the area, and um, let him sleep for a while. He wakes up, so we start to head toward the store. He's like, man, I've got to go to the restroom. We're going to stop at this mm. gas station. I'm like, okay. And we're by this area that kind of was very sus suspect to me about, I wonder what's really going on here, how these businesses are really affording to stay open. It looks like other places I've seen kind of eyeballing it like that. She runs in to go and then this truck comes. And uh, what I've learned is they have special light signals they can give. Like they either have additional lights on or they can even manipulate their headlights to where one moment they have one out and then the next moment they don't. And then sometimes uh, it'll be a color, just one side, not just, you know, colored lights, but it's like almost like a, optometrist thing like a lens will come down and whoop, now it's a blue light or there is no light so anyway this truck went by with a very obviously like doing some kind of signal to me at least and i was like what was that so she comes out of the bathroom and uh this van pulls in and she goes did you see that and i was like mm -hmm. creepy van she's like yeah but the baby i was like what baby she's like there was a baby in the front and it's not like in a car seat or anything and i was like okay i'm gonna go to the bathroom and i'm gonna look so I go to go in while she's out in the car and I look over and there's this woman holding this baby and about at least four other kids standing up, no car seats in the back of a van crying with a mattress in it. Mm -hmm. um, I go in, I come out and I see her approaching people and she's got the baby in her hand and I'm like, oh, feel sorry for me. Because if, if it was, oh, feel sorry for me, she'd be out there with all of her kids, you know, mm -hmm. but it was more like, you know, suggestively rubbing the child's foot and then like, Oh, I just need help. I'm from Romania. I've been here about a month. Yeah, can you help me? Like, I, you know, and if you're still in doubt, <laughs> I immediately decided I'm going to film that she's now approached my friend uh, and is asking, you know, you know, is there anything I can do for some money? Um, I don't know if that's a Romanian accent or not, but that's yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I turn on my camera on my phone and I start filming like this. I've checked it's running because sometimes when I try to film things, it, it'll say it's recording and then it didn't record. Mm. So it's running. So I pretend I'm talking on the phone. I kind of like strategically walking around to get this van and what's occurring on video. Well, uh, and, and then I had snapped a photo of the license plate. Well, then I go to open my phone and my video has been blocked. So there's no longer video there. You can hear, but there's no video. And then the photo that I had taken of the license plates all smeared. Like you can't see it. It's like, um, and that happens a lot in these investigations. Actually, I really feel like they use technology because um, you can have the best phone of the best. And you try to take a picture of that man escorting that child at odd hours into that hotel room and not seeming like a parental figure and it'll blur. It just, it just does it every time without fail. Mm -hmm. So we decide we're going to follow them. Mm -hmm. Which didn't seem too weird. We were there first, you know, it's about time for us to leave, you know. So uh, we followed them to get the license plate and we're at this light that's red. And I don't know if we spooked them or what, but they ran the red light to go the other direction. We wait till the light's green and turn mm -hmm. and go around and we're heading to the store at this point because we got the license plate number. Mm -hmm. The next thing we know, we see the van and it gets behind us very aggressively um, so I said, Hey, just pull into that store over there. Cause there's cameras and it's well lit. Mm -hmm. So she pulled into there and then this huge truck, um, nearly rams into us and, um, comes really close beside us and like revs its engine at us and then like peels off. And we were then followed to the store surrounded. Uh, it was so surreal. Um, and I it was like, literally I've been hard hitting, investigating these places for months 
now and like literally I just show up and run away to the store and we're seeing this much. That is how prevalent it is. Well, and they all you know, they did that. They all weren't up to no you're good. Exposing, you're exposing child trafficking. You you were capturing it, and that's why they wanted to. Um, they were they they were trying to prove a point with you, trying to intimidate you. I'm guessing, or were they actually trying to attack you in that moment? Yes. Both. Uh, yeah. Probably both. Um, again, I have to touch on my faith. I really do feel like um, that my faith uh, gives me divine protection. I, I've walked into so many things you wouldn't even believe, and walked out mm -hmm. of it. I've been given words to say to some very wicked people, and they're confounded and I don't know how to explain it other than, you know, my faith, uh, in that protection and mm. being guided. Yeah. Mm.